At least it didn't happen while you were playing. <laughs> So many things I like about the way you're playing this, this music. It was interesting, we both have our iPads. <laughs> Something Bach would have not known what in the world this is all about. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm really sincere when I say I really like the way you're playing this music because you're keeping it in a certain scale that I think is right. You know, mm -hmm. You're not letting it get overblown. Um, and, and you're doing so many very refined, subtle things with the sound. I can imagine you would play Chopin beautifully. Huh? No, I can just hear that. I can hear that, that, that sensitivity in your playing. It's wonderful. I admire that tremendously because I rarely hear that kind of playing in Bach. And I think it fits in many ways um, Bach's music because he is definitely not a kind of uh, uh, um, uh, abstract uh, composer where everything should just be very prim and proper and correct and, and never any, any expression. And you bring so much expression to it, so it's wonderful. And of course, you know, he didn't write for the, for the Kawaii or the, or the Steinway or anything like that, but for the instruments of his time, but he loved the clavicle because uh, he could do the kinds of things that you're doing, those, those kinds of nuances, the kind of shading. Now that being said, I have to disagree with a couple of things. Huh? Uh, you know, we, we, we all have to be open to different points of view, different opinions, and with Bach, you know, no matter what you do, somebody's going to disagree with it, more than likely. <laughs> Right? Because um, uh, a lot of people think, well, they are the authority, they know how Bach should go, and you know, we have all these stories about people who were so sure you know, that, that I know how to play Bach, and they even made these editions where they give us lessons, and they, they publish their lessons, and, and, and we buy the edition, we buy their interpretation. So you know, everybody has a different opinion about, about how to play Bach. So I, I, would, I would really enjoy hearing you play Bach much more than a lot of other people, I would have to say that, because of what you do, the qualities you bring to it. What I disagree with, though, is that it sounds like you're approaching each one of these movements kind of the same. You know? and, and when you think about what is the suite, it's a collection of dances you know, that, that over centuries they came from different countries, they all had different origins. They went through many, many changes. They originally were very simple dances that, that people did. Uh, then they came, became collected by the French harpsichord composers, especially Couperin. Um, and, and, then, and then Bach came along, and by that time, the, the, the suite was kind of already almost established as a form of music, but he, he, he gave it even more order, you know, and, and the order of the dances that he consistently does, Alamon, Koran, Saraband, and then something inserted, optional dance, and then ending with the G. So that became the standard form of the suite. But, you know, each one of these is different. Each one of these has a different character. And I don't hear quite enough that you're bringing out the differences. For example, the Alamand and the Courant sound pretty much the same, the way you approached them. Both were beautifully played, with a lot of sensitivity to shaping and uh, melodic line, and, and the way you did the ornaments is, is all really beautiful. But I didn't really hear there was a lot of difference between the Alamand, which is, as you're playing it, a very expressive and very um, doesn't seem to be quite working. These things are supposed to be indestructible. <laughs> it's not working somehow. Well, anyway, I'll just have, oh, there we go. Okay, just had to tinker with it. 
Um, the Alamant is, is very beautiful the way you playing it very sensitively and very expressively as it should be played. But I don't think you should take exactly the same approach to the Quran. Not that it should lack expression, but the Quran means running. Yeah? And, and to me, it didn't quite have the rhythmical energy, the rhythmical vitality. And the things that Bach does in the Quran with rhythm, you know, uh, you have a you have that yuppa, which which suggests a kind of leap or or, or something, you know. And so you played it very smoothly, nice lyrical uh, approach to the sound, just as you did in the alamon. I, I would take a different approach. I would show that this is a different character now from the Alamad. It's, 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 uh, the Quran is the most uh, athletic <laughs> of, the, of, of, of the dances. Yum, bum, bum, bim, bum, ba, yum, bum, or whatever. And then he plays with the rhythm so much with how he can group notes uh, that, that, that um, go somewhat um, um, contrary to the meter. See, those high notes, those upper notes, don't fall where we think they should. Yeah? And so there's this kind of playing around, playful quality of, 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 of with the rhythm that I think you could bring out more and make it really different from the Alamand. Huh? Let's start again. Let's go back to the Alamand and, and to just yeah, let me hear it one more time. And, and I, I would just have one little comment about the Alamand. <clears throat> I, as, as I say, I love the expressiveness and the refinement and the subtlety of details that you're bringing to this music. Be careful. Always remember these are 18th century dances. And, and they're not just simple dance. It's not simple dance music. I'm not saying that this is accompaniment to dance, because it's far beyond that. It's much more sophisticated and, 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 and on a very, very high artistic level. But the root, the roots of the music are in the 18th century dance. So we, I think, have to remember not to remove that dance feature from music. Hmm? Uh, so that you have lots of eighth notes in the left hand. Or whatever your tempo is. I wouldn't mess around with those so much. You know? I would let those be what they are, just like the steps of the dance, hmm? and not do a lot of uh, changing of the tempo, or, or you know, and do whatever you're doing so beautifully, but do it within the framework of an 18th century dance piece. Hmm? Yeah, does that make sense to you? Yeah. So it just it just means let's be a little bit more aware of our rhythm, of how we're treating the rhythm, how we're treating the the rhythmic pulse. And, and still do whatever we want to do with our expression and, and so on. Could you try it once more? And just when you start, do you think of the tempo, yum, bum, 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 bum. Have it going in your, so that the music is going on in your head before you, before you start. See, I don't quite tell, you don't quite tell me enough about, about the actual tempo by the way you start, because I feel you're starting kind of tempo rubato. But if you, show me what your actual tempo is. Good, now I get it. Now can you do the opening and, and start really, not tempo rubato, but right in that tempo for and so your upbeat is already 
in the dance mode, huh? It's not yum, pom, and mm, yum. Very good, very good. But I don't think you're giving me quite enough information about the meter. I hear the, I hear the upbeat here, but I don't hear what's supporting it. <laughs> you have that, and he puts that on the first beat, and then, and, and that so clearly defines the meter that we're in. And you're kind of concealing that from me. <laughs> huh? Yeah, do it. Do it, everything that you're bringing to it, all of the beauty, all the refinement, but do it within the framework. Again, it's an 18th century dance piece. Huh? I could feel, yes, this, 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 this has the connection with the dance. Hmm? dances are in what we call binary form, and is there are two parts. So let's not make it into four or six or eight different parts, you know? It really is just one musical sentence or, or paragraph that we don't want to divide up into too many little segments. Hmm? By taking time every time there's a cadence, or doing a little rubato here, a little rubato there, it robs the music of this simplicity that, it, that, it's, that it's rooted in, this, this dance simplicity. And that was beautiful, because you did all the nuances that, uh, that you do so well, but you did it within the framework of a dance that's always moving. Dancers always, always move, you know, because dancers have to put the next foot down, don't they? And they, you know, if they feel they have to wait for that beat, it makes it feel very unnatural. In terms of the dance, that was beautiful, and and um, I love everything that you're doing. Now, would you go on to the uh, to the Quran and show me that? Now, the Alamand is a rather serious and and uh, expressive and flowing dance in four. Now the Quran is a very lively kind of running dance in three. convince me though that it's that it's really um, a dance where the dancers would be running and leaping mm -hmm. uh, and I think some of it is your left hand can you just play your left hand one just as you as you normally play it yeah so to me that's a little too smooth uh, I would detach not just I think yum. It, 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 it brings a certain um, lift, you know. If there's running and leaping, the feet aren't going to stay on the, on the ground. Huh? It's going to be one of these dances where uh, the, the feet almost never touch the ground or not for very long, so you don't start with that kind of yum. We start with that feeling. Hmm? And that right away um, tells us that this is a different kind of dance from Then we have the, yeah, this is different. This is that kind of dance, not. Whenever we have a syncopation, and that's yep, 
it's a good idea not to connect the notes completely, you know, because that um, kind of robs it of that. Yeah. It could be a, a little skip or a little leap or something, you know. All these little uh, choreographic implications <laughs> that are in the music. And I, uh, you started really well with the feeling that this is our tempo, not, not kind of easing into it. Hmm? And this also has an upbeat. Try to feel. And I would also consider thinking this more in one than in three. Instead of one, two, three, one, two, gum, bum, bum, bim, bum, 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 ba. Then the syncopation has more life to it. Because if you're this thing, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, the syncopation just feels like another beat. Huh? <laughs> and, and that robs it of that, uh, the fun. Huh? Have more fun with it. Really run and leap. Yeah, yeah, and even I, I think you can arrive there. Uh, without um, without doing that, that's very beautiful, uh, and and it's really nice, and, and shows a lot of sensitivity. But I don't think it quite fits this character, mm -hmm. yeah, which is just like a more more of this rather than huh? yep, bum, bum, bum. and see how much fun he's having with the rhythm. Bum, 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 bum. the other way. See how he encourages us to feel 3-1, 3-1, 3-1, that, huh? that rhythm and not and then against that. Having so much fun with the rhythm and we should too. Yeah? Can you try it again? And yeah, feel it inside, you know, feel it, feel it. Now, this is not the Alamont anymore. This is the cool one. Huh? So, do what? Um, yeah, sure, go ahead, do it again. Yeah, you don't have to be really metronomic uh, going from the end of one section to the next section because the dancers need a little, a little time to breathe, don't they? <laughs> After all this running and leaping, you know, huh, catch my breath <laughs> before we go on. So catch your breath before you go on. Good. Uh, that's the idea. Does that, does that make sense to you? I know it's a little different from the way you're approaching it, but I would at least try it. Because hmm? I think then, then right away we we hear, yeah, each one of these is different in in, in, in character. Um, a saraband. Again, it, it was beautiful and so many um, wonderful, sensitive things that you do. Um, but for me, it, it 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 is no longer a dance; it's a nocturne. It's a beautiful nocturne. Uh, could have been written by Chopin. An, an early Chopin nocturne, un, un, unknown until now. <laughs> but try to keep it in the framework of, 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 of an 18th century dance. One, two, three, one, da 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 dee, um, pum, pum, Keep it within that framework. You can still do all the nuances that you're doing. Can you try it? Did you like it? You 
could live with it. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you see how, how Bach leads us. It's, it's, it's like he is the, leading the dance, because he always tells us, Didam, go to there. Go to your first beat. And three and one. He says, go on. And then he does what is characteristic of a saraban, which is to arrive on the second beat in the melody, uh, as he does in the second measure. And he puts an ornament there. Um, do, you, uh, do you play this in a performance with or without the repeats? Never? Oh, I didn't know before. Yeah, I know you didn't now, but, but except for the air. But in, in, a, in a setting where you were, yes. say, programming this piece, do you do repeats? Yes. And, and then on the repeats, um, you do some different ornamentation. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, can you show me what you would do on the second part? Let's say you played it now the first time. Now you're going back and you're taking the repeat. What would you do? Can you just give me a demonstration? That's fine. That's fine. And, and, and it's, it's, it's actually good not to remember what you did previously. Do it differently. Uh, the point of, imp of, of ornaments, of putting in ornaments of our own, adding to what's there on the page, is that it's, it's improvisation. Hmm? Uh, and this music is rooted in improvisation. Uh, and, and there's ornamentation from the very beginning. It's written out. It's written out ornamentation, because he's just simply taking the primary notes of the, of the triad and filling them in from here to there. And, and he does it in so many of these pieces. It, it's written out embellishment. And you know the second part, he Very similar kind of ornamentation, written out ornamentation. You know? He's filled in the, the spaces between the notes, which is what the aesthetic of, of, of this time was not to leave anything unadorned. No, nothing should be bare or no empty places. You see this in the painting and the architecture and everything. You even see it in, 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 in Bach's handwriting if you ever take a look at the copies of his manuscripts. It's beautiful, the way he writes, the, the, the way he just writes the notes. It has this sort of calligraphy, uh, you know, and scroll work, and you can just, you know, uh, think that's really his world. So good that you don't remember what you did. Now just do something that you make up right now on the spot. <laughs> like you're just improvising when you do this, when you add a little extra embellishment, a little extra ornament. Now, notice when you have distances between the notes. And, and, and Bach teaches us about how to embellish uh, passages that have distances other than a second, other than a scale step. You know this? Um, Everybody's studied that, the first invention. You know there are two versions. There's the one we're all familiar with. And then there's 
where he does that. He fills in. So here's an opportunity for you. Yeah. It's a little embellishment we can insert. And there are other places where we can do something similar. Wherever there's a space between the notes bigger than a, a second, we can fill in that space. Hmm? Um, that's the, the plain version. Right? Yeah, and he does this. He writes it out in so many of his pieces. So I'm sure that he uh, allows us the opportunity to do that, especially on repeats. Besides adding an extra mordant or an extra trill or, or things of that sort, which are the, the kind of official ornaments, you know, the ones that are written in symbols, we can do these other embellishments uh, as well. And, and it should always sound like this is not what I have always done and always practiced so that I know exactly what I'm going to do. It should sound like, oh, I just had this inspiration <laughs> to add this embellishment. Then it becomes really an improvisation. And that's what it's meant to be. All these composers were great improvisers. All of them. Bach was a terrific improviser. He could improvise anything, fugue, whatever. Mozart, you know, all these stories about the skills in improvisation. Beethoven, I mean, you know, they all did it. They all did it. And we, we, it's a kind of lost art. Huh? You know, the only, the only real improvisers today are jazz musicians because they really do improvise. They don't write their music down. They make it up on the spot, and they have so much fun doing it. Huh? And, and we've kind of lost that whole tradition that, that was so alive in Bach's time. So feel that, that you, you have the privilege. <laughs> you have the opportunity, and, and you can make it something of your own. You feel you're part of the creative process that way, you know, which was, which was kind of the, the, uh, the attitude is that we don't have this compartmentalization. These are the composers who write the music. These are the performers who play it. No, uh, composers performed, performers composed. It was all basically one and the same. So we're expected to be part of that creative process. But now just do keep in mind these are dances. Uh, and they're rooted in dance, which has its own kind of aesthetic, hmm? and, and especially when it comes to rhythm. You know, we can't remove them from the world of dance. I'm so glad that you played the second minuet, because there are some editions that don't have it. But it's beautiful. And uh, the only thing I would try to do is really make it sound different from the first. You played the first minuet with a really beautiful singing legato. Maybe the second minuet could have a different kind of articulation. Just you could think maybe a little bit more of that. Or you could think of it as if this were on the harpsichord and you have this thing called a lute stop on the harpsichord, which makes the instrument sound like a lute, a strummed instrument. So you can find a, maybe a different color for the second minuet, and then go back to the first minuet. And um, you took the air at an appropriate, appropriately lively tempo. I'm wondering, I've seen in some editions, the meter is cut time, not 4-4. Four four. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure which is correct. But to me, it does feel more into it's a lively air. Yeah. It's not um, a kind of vocal aria. It's just another name for a dance that, that didn't have a sort of other name, you know, Sarabande or something. It's just a dance, so call it an air. Um, there's, there's one note um, that's in, in another, you know, there, there, are, there are different copies of, of all of these pieces that Bach had different people copy them out, and sometimes he um, wanted some changes, or they made changes somehow. And so in the copy made by his son-in-law, uh, Alt Nico, of this piece, in, in the measure from the, before the end, one, two, three, fourth measure from the end, where you have in the left hand, 
which is what you have and what you played in the alt nickel copy is uh -huh. <laughs> interesting isn't it huh but it's it's there and and you can't say that that this is a mistake uh -huh. uh, so it's 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 it, it's it's something to consider and it, it sounds i think a little more interesting That's such an ordinary, <laughs> but this is not. And I know it's just one note, but I, I, I think it's worth considering doing it that way instead of the, the way it's written, which is very normal. Um, in the G, I, I, would, I would have this, again, just a little bit more lively in spirit. Hmm? The, the, the jig is, is one of the dances that, that really didn't kind of fit into the, the, the tradition of the court, you know. He normally didn't dance the jig in, in, in the court because it's just, it's just too lively, you know. And it's, it's kind of the, the Irish sailor <laughs> sort of jig, you know. Just more of that kind of feeling to it. I think I'll leave him a little faster tempo. And um, you, you, can, you can do some of these ornaments or you can leave some of them out or you can, you can change them around. Um, you can even, where, where you have, you can do, you can do that. Huh? You can still incorporate ornamentation and, and, and not struggle with <laughs> the challenge of doing all these quick ornaments on the, on the piano, which is much harder than on the harpsichord. But I would, I would bring to it a little bit more Lively. -dum 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 -dum. Can you try it? Just the opening. A little more downbeat. Yeah, a little more yum. -ba -dum -bum -ba -dum. A little more feeling of the downbeat. Da -da -dum. Da -da -dum. Da -da -dum. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I think he puts all these ornaments in there to give it that, that kind of feeling, huh? Yeah. Anyway, uh, I know we're out of time, but just some thoughts for you, and thank you again for your beautiful playing. Real pleasure to hear you. Uh, and now, is it Byron?
So for me, there are four movements, right? And yeah. for me, the first movement, of course, is the most like the aggressive one. Angry, and maybe angry, yeah, yeah, like kind of like, yeah. yeah. Yes, and the second movement for me is like, for me, the picture is like really smooth from behind the camera, like somewhere like calm. In yeah. In the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And, and the third movement, movement way, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and the third yeah. movement is kind of like, for me, for me, I know it's quite typical, for me, it's feels like, a zombie is dancing. Uh, zombie is dancing? Uh -huh. like okay. kind of creepy, yeah, something not quite real. Yeah, yeah, kind of yeah. something in the imagination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's somehow beautiful, but not that like traditional. Beautiful in, a, like, in yeah. its own way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and of course, the last moment, we all know, yeah. <laughs> that just threw me for a ride on steroids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, good. So I think it's important, you know, to see it. All three of these so-called war scenarios, you know, you know, six big, big, massive wars, and they're all they're all written about the same time, and they reflect the you know the times they were written in. They were lots of imagery that we can kind of imagine had something to do in Prokopiev's mind with with what was going on. But I think it's important that we that we have this perspective mm -hmm. of the music. And, and this, is, this is a very big movement. You know, it's, a, it's, a very, it's like a panorama to me. You know? It's something we have to kind of step away from and view from a distance and kind of see the whole picture rather than up close looking at every detail. Not that we should ignore details. We should never ignore details. But for me, you have to have a little more perspective of this. I feel you're a little caught up in every little thing that's happening. And, I want to ask you the tempo, tempo of a very slow waltz. Is the waltz one, two, three, one, two, three, one? Is that the waltz? Or is it one, two, three? Because it could be either one. It could be the, the triplet eighth, eighth notes within the dotted quarter or it could be the three dotted quarters. How do you feel it? For me, actually, I feel three. I feel both beats. You feel? Like one, two, three. So the big beat? Yeah, the big beat. OK. I didn't hear that. That's what I missed. huh? Okay. To me, you were focusing on the small beats within the big beats. No? Do you understand yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I wanted to feel this more. Uh, sweep. Uh, if you were conducting it, you probably wouldn't conduct the eighth notes because that would lock everybody in. You know, they would have to play like metronome, and you didn't play it metronomically. I don't mean that, but it, it, to me, you were too focused on 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 each eighth note, hmm? and the way you were listening and. And, and, and where, your, where your focus was on every eighth note. Try getting a little bit away from that. No, this bench is giving me trouble. Try getting a little bit away from that so you feel yum, Because for one thing, Prokopiev writes very long melodies, very long phrases. Hmm? They don't just go for a couple of measures. They go on, and then they lead to other melodies. And it's just kind of constantly unfolding narrative, isn't it? Huh? Yeah. So I think it helps us if we feel that, that it's really the one. Um, and, and just as I was mentioning, 
in the Bach, composers have a way of leading us onto where, where their thought is going. See, he always leads us over the bar line. Three, he leads us to it. So it's always going somewhere. Huh? And then he goes to there. Yeah. Uh, so that's another reason why I would not feel it's the pulse is the eighth note, but the dotted quarter. And it's, it's not necessarily uh, telling you to play it faster, but just to, to feel the pulse a little more, as you were telling me. Huh? Yeah, you, you were right. Now I want to hear it. Can you try it? Try the opening again. that feel that that's just taking you it's, 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 it's a kind of a motion, you know. Um, I could imagine this, I don't know, this is probably way far away from what Prokofiev was thinking. I could imagine being on a ship, huh? and, and, and the ship moves, and it goes this way, and then it goes that way, you know. Huh? And so there's this and then uh, I, I also imagine if you were if you were standing and trying to trying to get your your balance, but you have you have two ropes around you, you know, and one person is tugging you this way and the other one is tugging you that way. And it sort of has this, you know, this kind of feeling I get from the music. And it's not one, two, three, do you sit it's that kind of feeling, I think, is, is somehow built into this music. saying that that's all there is to the piece, but I, but I think that is a way to, uh, to start it with the right kind of rhythmical feeling, huh? and this sort of sweep, hmm? and long lines that go on for a very long time. Huh? Yeah? Does, that, does that make sense to you? Now, <coughs> this movement I think, and since you play the whole sonata, I'm sure you've, you've studied the different themes. And of course, you know, the, the first movement has so much of that in it, huh? towards the end. It's almost like, like a scream, ya da 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 ya da 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 it's, it's just, it's, it's hammered into our ears over and over again. Then we get a relief from that in the second movement. But is it just a coincidence that he starts with, with these three notes? Because it's, it's the same three notes as... It's, it's a different order, but it's the same three pitches, actually. Hmm? It's, it's possible that... I don't know if he did that consciously or if it just somehow was in his unconscious mind that... that Is somehow related. And then he does remind us of that in several places. To me, this movement is a collection of memories. It's 
a collection of memories. And they're, they're memories from the, the first movement, uh, and they come back. You said zombies dancing. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's very original and, 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 <laughs> and very descriptive. But, 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 but yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's something not just quite real and here and present and, and right now. It's like something we experienced before, and now the memories are coming back. And it's like in a dream where, you know, nothing is clear cut and defined and real. <laughs> it's all just one thing is leading to another, and we don't know how, the, how our unconscious minds work, you know. But, but we, know, we know what it's like to dream. <laughs> uh, so I, I would feel it a little bit more with this nostalgia to it. Not like the present, here and now. Everything is happening now. But it's recalling things that happened earlier. But I think it's very interesting. And, and, and it's, it's what Prokofiev does so well that makes him unique. What key does he start in? Huh? C, yeah. So we feel it's going to be a piece in C major, right? Yeah. And we would, I would have to say, what key is the movement in? And of course you would say, it's in C major. And you'd be absolutely right. Huh? But how many notes in the very first measure are not part of C major? This note. That whole chord, that whole chord, that whole chord. Those are not C major at all, are they? No, they're far from C major. So right away, yeah, we feel C major, but but not the normal C major. All these, and then we get a C major, but it doesn't continue to be C major. And then before long, we're. C major, huh? Um, it's very unsettled, isn't it? It's very almost ambiguous, and and and, and yeah, we know we started in C major, but <laughs> it, it it goes far away from C major, and then then occasionally comes back, and then goes far and far away. Um, it's just always interesting to to look at how Prokofiev writes in a very tonal centered language, but with a mixture hmm, of things that are foreign to the key, but he, it's this concoction, it's this brew that he comes up with. And, and, um, Tugging and pulling of the hmm? of the of the large beat, right? Yeah, I would be careful not to. So the uh, that's just one group.
slips into A flat. And It, it, it starts as if it's going to go on, and then so I, I, I wouldn't slow down. I would play it as if, as if we expect it to, to keep going with this theme we've already heard now several times, but it's, it gets interrupted by something else, and, and, and then it starts again, and, and it gets interrupted, and then goes on somewhere else. Yeah, um, when this, this theme comes in, which you know he'll use later on. Have you gone through the score and just kind of marked in where different themes pop in and then pop back in? And, and there are all these kinds of references, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, remember we heard this back here. Yeah, here it is again. Uh, sorry about that. Reconnect here. Um, that theme comes back later. I don't know if you've noticed. Yeah, it comes back uh, at an unexpected place. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's in the left hand, it's in the tenor range where it returns to the a tempo. it in uh, as a counter melody to the original yeah. subject. Yeah, you've noticed that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah make me notice it. <laughs> make everybody notice it. Yeah, show that connection. Uh, actually, it happens even earlier. It, it seems to be coming, another memory that seems to just float, float back in. Um, but the way you introduce this theme you didn't make it clear that that's, that's really the theme because you brought out the notes right before it. You brought out which is not thematic. It's not thematic, really. Um, See, it's not thematic. It's just the extension of now. That's the theme, and he marks that mezzo piano. You see that in your score? Yeah. So that's what you have to make make everybody notice, so that we hear. Ah, it's like a it's like a novel. You're introduced to this character early on, and then and then that character comes back, and another character enters in, you know, and then that character maybe leaves, but comes back again later. All these connections, you see, all these reference points of, of the thematic material. That's, that's an important task that we have, you know, to show that, to show these threads. So don't introduce it with a big crescendo right before it. Go once from, from there. This is back, uh, um, yeah.
because that's not yet the, the, the theme that he wants us to, to hear. It's what happens right there, like a new instrument comes into the, into the picture. You know? So this is, this is not something important. But now, mm, mm, highlight that, then we'll know, ah, this is a theme now I need to get into my ears. these crazy twisted intervals that Prokofiev does. It, 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 it seems to be in the A flat, A flat minor, but then it, is, it goes wild and goes all over the place, huh? Yeah, but it's important that we hear that thematic material hmm, as a reference to what happens later. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and continue to keep this feeling of, of the big beat. Of, of the big three, not, not the small three. Then the poco più animato, I thought didn't really seem to be ani any più animato. It seemed, if anything, slower. Uh, but the, the più animato is the big beat. Hmm? He changes the meter from 9-8, but the pulse stays the same. He clearly indicates that where the meter changes from 9-8, yam ta ta ti ra ra ti ra ra dum dum ti to 3, but without changing the pulse, ti ra ra ti ra 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 ti ra ra This should be a quicker pulse, and the quarter note should be quicker. Can you can you get get into that from somewhere before? This is not a place to retard. Yeah? We've only started another part of the journey. Don't slow us down right away. We've only begun, and you know, this, this very kind of creepy, and all, all, all minor seconds. Then he comes to this place where he brings in another theme. He, he, he has some interesting doubling <laughs> instrumentation. You can imagine that as two wind instruments perhaps playing that. Um, it's, it's very orchestral, as a lot of Prokofiev's piano music is. Then he introduces this theme, which just starts. That theme will also come back. Really loud and heavy. Hmm? So again, we need that, our ears need that reference. Hmm? So, so we hear the connection. And, and, and I lost it when you got. Those 
repeated E-flats are all marked with a line. Uh, don't conceal those notes from me, they're important. All, all three of these war sonatas use this repeated note, um, um, um. You find it in, in the seventh sonata. You find it in the eighth sonata. Um, uh, and uh, I was told by someone that this is symbolic. Hmm? Uh, this, this, this three repeated notes, uh, that it's um, representing supposedly Morse code. Do you know what Morse code yeah, is? Hmm? Yeah. yeah. Back in the day, before we had cell phones and email, uh, people in wartime in the Second World War, the only way they had to communicate was with uh, codes, yeah. telegraph and, and code signals. And you know, the dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. That's Morse code for SOS. Wow. Huh? So when someone's in distress, <laughs> they need to send a signal to let them know. They send it through Morse code. You couldn't pick up your, your cell phone and call somebody. Huh? So I was told this by someone who supposedly knows this music better than I do, that, that these repeated notes are symbolic of, of that. Hmm? So take it or leave it. <laughs> but he writes it to be brought out. Every time he has these repeated notes, he puts lines on them. There, and then again. Another reference point. Hmm? It's another reference point. Uh, so, I mean, we, we could go into lots of other aspects of this music, but uh, just um, when you go through it, I, I would make it a point to highlight what 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 you really want to show your listener. Hmm? Yeah. Um, uh, and then here he does what's, what's so typical of Prokofiev. We have the theme, but, but it's all kind of broken up, if, you know, disassembled, as it were, and it keeps shifting, shifting registers. Uh, and and uh, he, he, does, he does that in a number of places where you have one theme, but it keeps, it keeps changing from one register. It's all very unsettled and destabilized, and, and it should feel that way. So you made me feel a little bit too stable, I would say, in, in the way you played it, huh? A little too grounded, huh? And I don't mean you should do wild and crazy things <laughs> with the rhythm, but, but I would like to hear a little bit more of this kind of, yeah, uncertainty, huh? Uh, uprootedness uh, and uh, yeah the big the big climactic moments it's not just what what you do at those moments is not the most important thing but it's how you lead into them and and a lot of times what he does is 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 unexpected like the sudden key change to d major that just comes out of the blue doesn't it huh yeah uh, and, and, and it should sound that way. Um, and, and you notice that I, I almost thought you were finished when you play. And it sounded like that was the end of the movie. Huh? You want everybody to think that's the end. Okay. Well, just be careful because if you just play this movement alone, they might start applauding your play. <laughs> And it does seem like it's over, but it's still very uncertain. It's very undefined. You know, it doesn't really feel like an ending because we have this sort of ambiguous, is it E minor or is it C major? And then just the G. Another G, another G. And then... It leaves us kind of up in the air, doesn't it? Huh? 
Yeah, and then what happens after that? It's very ambiguous, isn't it? Huh? Is it C major? There's no C. Is it E minor? There's, there's no fifth. Huh? It's, it's very un, undefined and on, on purpose. It's, we don't know. We don't really know. It's ambiguous. Could be C major. Not sure. And then we have a reference to the opening theme. And then it ends on just a C with just the G being held. There is no E. It doesn't end on a C major triad. It ends. Again, it's, it's a bit ambiguous on purpose, huh? It's not just cut and dried. And it never is. <laughs> That's the thing about this movement. It's never cut and dried. It's never so totally defined that we know exactly where we are at every moment. Huh? So try to create that uh, sort of, as you said, dream world, you know, which is a good description of the piece and, and, and make us feel that, that, that instability but but it's still I mean it has it has its logic to it it has its organization it's not uh, uh, chaotic it's yeah. movement so that's this movement over, I, I feel like like a bunch of like uh, soldiers who are dancing or who are sad to lift their wing over the wall but at the end like they find they are actually already dead and they are actually so uh huh interesting that's interesting like, yeah they yeah they cannot be like this like grounded yeah. Really something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's 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 good that you that you're creating some kind of image in your own mind because I think that's very helpful. Yeah. Huh? And I always felt this is very like huge to yeah. I mean, normally we have this thing for a movement that I would go to play. Yeah, by yeah. itself, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because we need the context of the whole piece, I right? Felt, as I'm curious, but I just wanted to really find out. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think you, you, can, you can create the, the kind of dream world that, that you want to do, but still give the listener enough information to latch on to, you know, that, that it's not just whatever, what's going on, you know. <laughs> Show them, yeah, this relates to this, this has a reference back here, and now this theme comes back. Uh, you know, then it's, it's a dream world, but one that still makes sense at the same time, you know. All right? Good job. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. I enjoyed it very much. No, something totally different. <laughs> oh, is this your cell phone, Byron? Oh, yes. Hello, she you with the Chopin variations. All right.
Thank you, Xu Yu. Please forgive me. I need a one minute break and I'll be right back. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your performance. It was wonderful. doing? Yeah, I'm in the middle of a master class. You know, this, this, this piece was not performed very much for a very, very long time, mm -hmm. you know? And then it seems that it's been rediscovered. <laughs> and, and now it seems to be gaining popularity. And who knows, maybe it'll become the in thing now. <laughs> the latest fad, uh, a Chopin work we, we rarely heard, and when we did hear it, it was usually in the version with orchestra, which was what he originally wrote. Uh, but then we know that Chopin himself played it as a solo piece later on. You know the, the story of the first performance of this piece? It was his debut in Paris. Mm -hmm. It was his first public concert. And he was, I don't know, 17, something like that. Yeah. and. Uh, so he played this piece and it was such an enormous success. It, it was, you know, what, what, what uh, made him suddenly famous and <clears throat> what, uh, what Schumann, who heard the performance, wrote in his, in his uh, publication, hats off, gentlemen, a genius. A genius has arrived. So this is the piece that um, made Chopin famous and the, the performance was was such a huge success that Chopin wrote about it later on. And um, he said, the audience applauded so loudly after each variation <laughs> that you couldn't even hear the orchestra <laughs> play the, the interludes. So uh, w w what a thing to complain about. <laughs> uh, yeah, so really you play it extremely well and very impressive what you're doing. Um, before I say anything else, I, I want to just talk about the way you ended the piece, the way you finished the piece. There is something in performing a piece like this that we have to just accept the fact that there's a certain amount of theatricality about it. 
isn't it? Huh? I mean, we have to sometimes be theatrical. <laughs> not, not if we're playing Beethoven Opus 111, but if we're playing a piece like this, it's... And, and uh, you have to think about it. You have to think, about how are you going to end this piece in such a way that you're going to bring everybody to their feet? They're going to just, you know, want to stand up and shout, brava, or whatever, huh? How are you going to end it? That's something to think about, because I didn't think that your ending quite made it. You know, for one thing, you sort of did this. That's not quite going to do it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's something we have to do, even if it's not natural to us to do it. But we have to do something that's going to just really be theatrical in a certain way. You know, I mean, it has to have that kind of wow feeling to it. You know, I'm not going to make you do it now, but I would like you to think about it. Um, because as well as you play the piece, you want that ending to just wow everybody, right? And all you have are those chords, but it's important how you do them. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah you can't just sort of, there it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, what I think might help you in your performance, because it's already very, very good, and you do so many of the technical challenges really, really well. I would like you to bring more imagination to it. Imagination for sound, imagination for color, for shaping, for all the things we know Chopin was famous for mm -hmm. and that he did just naturally, you know, because nobody had to teach him that. Mm -hmm. Nobody could teach him that. Huh? Yeah. He didn't need to be taught that. He just knew. He just seems like he was just a born pianist. And, you know, the, pianist was, the piano was part of him. And all of these ornamentational things that he does, you do them, you do them well. They're technically well done, I would say. Nothing was, was wrong. Nothing was you know, uh, messy or sloppy. But can they, can they just be a little bit more captivating you know, with what you do with the sound, with maybe how much diminuendo you make or how you shape the sound in some way? You know? Just even a little bit more than what you did. Start from where, where, your, where your entrance is. Le leave out the very intro. It's nice, but can it be? I don't want to. I don't want to even show you what to do because I, I couldn't. I couldn't. But you should should have something, yeah, like a singer. Hmm? Uh, you start with a trill and and you shape it even a little bit more than what you're doing. dripping from your fingertips, you know? That, that, that kind of uh, sweet Not so dry, not so dry. time and watch out that your trill doesn't sort of do that keep 
the left hand, keep the left hand for legato. Keep the left hand legato. Nice, yes. And now the young mommy. Something different. And then it's suddenly it, it, it goes. To Configuration, build a little bit up and then uh, very um, sort of bell like sound at the very end of it. And underneath it is that singing, singing line. No, not, not, but not, not a harsh sound, just a warmer, warmer sound. I don't feel you take enough time when you have the opportunity to take more time. Try it once more. It's these little touches, you know, and, and, and I, I know I'm fussing with these little things, but it's these little touches that can, can, can make everybody go, ooh, ah, wasn't that delicious, you know? <laughs> Just that little turn, that little ornament. And that's the sort of thing that Chopin was able to do. Uh, nothing was just for sheer virtuoso display or, or uh, just, um, uh, you know, nothing was ordinary. Even these little, these little figurations. Turn them into something a little bit more uh, special. twice. Do something different with each one. Something like that. It's improvisation. It's all improvisation. It's not play two Fs exactly the same. You have the opportunity to do this and then, and then maybe the last one you want to come down or you want to go up, but, but don't just, don't ever do that. It's also timing, you know, the timing can be special if you just play. There's nothing special. Do something. This is what I mean. Use more imagination. Hmm? Use more imagination. He's hinting. He's hinting at the theme already. Huh? A, a little 
hint he gives us of what, what's, what's going to happen later. And these little, just like a little, a little waterfall, a little tiny waterfall trickling down. Huh? All of these little things, we have the opportunity to, to make them really special and, and, and something beyond just really playing them well, which you're, you're doing. But that's all I want to say is, is that take every advantage of every opportunity. You know? And, and that's it's something that can't really be taught. Um, but I, if you explore more, what can I do with that little figuration? How can I make it even more delicious, even more special, even more beautiful? Then the, um, the octave passage was very good. I would like you to shape a little bit more this, this one. Yeah, T. Because it sounded a bit all the same. Try it. I would hold that first note a little bit more. A little bit more free. And perhaps not slowing down there. Wait even, wait even more. From then then. T, be more free. It's a little too cut and dry. Um, something like that. That's right. So where you, the only places you have to be really in time are where you have these orchestral uh, interludes and things like that. And even this. I don't play it, but to me it was too much the same sound. Mm -hmm. It could be more like a cascade coming down and then leading us into, into the next part, and uh, Energico. These are the kinds of things that uh, I think if you, if you spend a little more time working them out, they could make your performance even, even better than it is. It's already very, very good. It's on a very high level. But these wonderful... Uh, Fioritura and, and ornaments, and this one. I think you can really build that up a little bit more and then come down even more than you did. Everything, everything is written with some kind of indication telling us, do something with our sound, isn't it? And every bar has either a hairpin or a crescendo or a decrescendo huh? or something. It's, it's really saying, do more than just play it technically perfectly and, and a little of this and a little of that. Do something a little bit beyond that. Do something really extraordinary when you have the opportunity. It's improvisation. It's improvisation. And it should sound like you're just making it up. Huh? <laughs> Hard to do. Because <laughs> we have to practice to get it right. And then we've got to play it so that it sounds like we're just doing it for the first time. Um, it, it, it said that, that, that Chopin loved to improvise, and he would come up with all of these figurations and all of these delicious fioritura and ornamentation, and then he would struggle to write it down because it's so hard to write down what you just improvise. You know, how do I put that on the page? <laughs> he struggled with that. It, it, it wasn't easy. And then when you have this, don't forget, here we have another hint in the left hand, another hint of the theme that's about to come. It was very clever about sort of just teasing us, you know, with these little hints of, of what's going of what's to come after that. So, um, and you didn't quite show me this. Try it once. Try it 
ahead once from 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 there. I think that I think that G comes just a little bit too soon. I know you have to get to all of that in. You, I think here you can be freer with your tempo. Don't don't be metronomic. Start maybe a little bit under tempo. And you can give this a little bit more time. You can be a little freer with it. Exaggerate, overdo it. And if you go too far, you can always pull it back. But now you're not quite going far enough. You know? Really overdo it. Hmm? Yeah, this, this is a piece that allows you to do that. It allows you to be naughty. Huh? If you can't be naughty in, in, in this piece, what, what piece can you be naughty in? I mean, you can do, you can do things that, that, that nobody else does. Mm? And you can get away with it. I don't mean tamper with the score and, and go crazy and, and, and uh, do things that are in, in terrible taste, but you can do a lot more with your sound. Mm? And, and it can be even better. Um, to me, you're taking the theme too seriously. Huh? Yeah. You're, you're playing it like it's a serious uh, aria. This is much too serious because I don't think that, that Chopin took it really seriously. Do you, do you think? Do you think he? No, I mean, he knew the opera, he knew the story, everybody knew it, he knew the opera, it was famous, and everybody knew this tune, and everybody knew, knew what happens in the opera, and, and the, the, the Don, uh, you know, trying to win over Serlina, but I don't think Chopin took it that seriously. Look at the bass he gives. Yo, bum, bum, ba, rum, bum, bim, ba, this is That's the way he writes it. It was a little too square. it as it were huh? and he's making it Chopin using Mozart's theme yeah? I think he's just having a lot of fun uh, and, and so if one time you you slow down a little bit maybe the next time don't so always make it sound fresh always make it sound like like it's different every time and he loves this little um, um, Two 
purpose he gives it. Huh? Yeah? Try it again. So yeah, from there is fine. Is uh, when you have. I think the first note is an up, not a down. So you don't want two notes the same, and you don't want three notes the same. Huh? Think of how you can make them different. That's what I mean, it sounded too square. It sounded too many. It sounded too much like that. Slight tenuto yam pam tatiram mam. He's having so much fun with that theme, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, good. And and the next variation, I mean, you do it extremely well. Is it time already? Oh, okay. Um, I would just like a little more shape. I'd like a little more shape. And that's asking a lot, because it's enough just to get the notes, isn't it? <laughs> Think of the hours it takes to practice, huh? Especially for small hands. For small hands, yeah, well, you're doing a great job. I mean, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's really admirable what you're doing. So, do, but just try to bring more shape into it. It will, it will bring it to life even more. Um, the same with, with, with this one, which, um, you do the right, the right version because you put the harmonies in the left hand and you play all the fast notes in the right hand. But can you have a little more fun with these little, mm, no, no, I don't play it. Those little waves that he puts in it. So it's not just a digital, diddle, 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 huh? yeah? Try it once. It's hard, <laughs> but but that would make it even more exciting. And then um, here, it, it, it is I think uh, very um, more expressive. And I think you can do something with this with this left hand. The, the little hairpins that he writes. Huh? He's always looking for a way to tell us not to just play notes. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Just like in the etudes. Mm -hmm. We know that those are hard enough technically to do, but then 
always the goal is to, to turn them into music, uh, which they are. This, um, I don't know, it's, I'm amazed that anybody can play it with these leaps. <laughs> I mean, it's almost as hard as, as the end of the second moon of the fantasy, because it's just all over the place. Um, I would um, just advise against using a lot of pedal. Use very little pedal. Instead. Did you, you used a little bit, I think, a little touch of pedal now and then, very sparingly. Um, and then the, the interludes, the orchestral interludes, I think you can vary those a little bit more, you know, depending on how you feel. Well, this variation has this sort of feeling to it now. Let me keep that through the interlude. Maybe the tempo doesn't have to be the same every time. It can change. Um, the transition into the adagio, you might consider Yeah, yeah, I, I, I like it, yeah. I like it. Because otherwise we just kind of sit there, you know. <laughs> and it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to take us into that, into that B flat minor. I think this can be even a bigger difference. I mean, this is really like Giovanni. And then this is... Beauty and the Beast or something like that. <laughs> big, big contrast, very dramatic, and, 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 and almost in a, in a kind of exaggerated way, which I'm sure his audience has loved, because they love that kind of theatricality. Mm -hmm. It's being very theatrical. Then the, um, the Polonaise, you might think about not starting quite so big, you know, so that it just, it just says, yeah. Chopin polonaise is you have to kind of get it into your into your blood, into your DNA that yum da 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 ba ba. Um, if you can go even faster, it's better. Faster is better. This goes on for a long time and it's like the end of the um, you know with all the triplets, the, the opus twenty two, the grand polonaise. But I think faster is better. Uh, it really gallops along, doesn't it? Huh? I mean, it was a little safe. Yeah? yeah? So be brave. <laughs> uh, and then, as I said, just you need to be a bit more theatrical at the very end. Yeah. It'll make your performance. Believe it or not, even if you weren't happy with, with what you did, but if you have this glorious ending, everybody's going to go, bah, 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 wonderful. <laughs> it's just the name of the game, isn't it? You know? Yeah, we're performers. And playing a piece like this, we have to, we have to remember that. You know? OK. All right. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Nice to see you. Natasha? Hi. Well, good. Are you playing all of them? Just the first. Just the first? The very first. OK.
actually the whole set? Huh? These are brand new. Oh, right. That's right. Um, yeah, I think you, you have a good feel for the music, and I think everything makes a lot of sense until you get to places where it measure, measure after measure of really soft playing. And when you get to those places, we, you, you hold your sound back so much, mm -hmm. it's like you're holding it all in. And, and, and the music doesn't seem to be going anywhere. So then when you get back to the, the bigger things, it, it comes to life. <laughs> so uh, I think you, you have to look at the soft places, the really soft places, the pianissimos, as a different color, a different kind of sound world from the rest, but still it has to have its own life. It has to have its own energy, so to speak, its own motion forward. Otherwise, we feel like we're stuck, and then we come back to life when it's louder, and we die when it's softer. <laughs> and it's kind of what's happened. You know, all the soft places kind of die. Uh, and I, I would, I know it's, it's, it's an impromptu, and it's, it's, uh, you have the opportunity to um, make some changes in the tempo, but I, I would be careful with where you do it and how much you do it, because sometimes you do it in places where it, it, it seems to not make a lot of sense. Um, if, you, if you wait so long before we get to where we're, we're going, uh, one place is where you have this <laughs>
doing the timing that works and, and that, that respects the, um, the importance of the silence is it doesn't confuse the listener as to where the pulse is. <laughs>
fact you composed in a way that's more like a sonata movement. Schumann thought these four impromptus were actually a sonata. He thought that's really what they are, a four movement sonata. And this one has that organic quality to it. So I think it makes more sense not to go into a completely different tempo when you come to this. Because it comes right out of what it's doing before that, that's the receiving line.
this has to do with how we give impression hmm, to, the, to the notes. I mean, where we put little stresses, uh, where, we, where we make a little slur, all of these things. And, and Schubert is very, is very sensitive to that. And it's, it's, it's his language. almost a contradiction that he says pianissimo and then appassionato. We think to be passionate we have to be loud. No, but it's soft. It's a lot of passion in it. Huh? And I think it, it helps to give it in the score because I think it's just as important what Schubert writes is just as important as what Beethoven writes or any composer that we have the greatest respect for uh, because he, he doesn't just do these things accidentally, these subtle differences. And then the other thing is take care of your rhythmic pulse that you don't confuse me. Huh? I know where we are. I know where it's an and, where it's a two, where it's a one, where it's a whatever. The rhythmical organization I think has to be clear, uh, in spite of the fact that we can take some liberties, we can, we can take some extra time, we can do things like that, but we can't do it to the extent that, that we lose the, the rhythmical huh, aspect of the music, because his rhythm is very, very um, close to his heart, and, and, and what he does with rhythm, or he puts accents unexpectedly in, in, in odd places, we wouldn't expect them. But it, it has some special meaning to him, right? So, um, yeah, all the rest, pretty much the same ideas. And, uh, yeah, the, 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 the ending was, was very good, but I would, I would not slow down too much after...